So uh, I'm Mark Stevens. I'm a uh, partner at Femmican West, which is a law firm in, uh, in the Silicon Valley. And I've worked in the game space for 35 years, uh, represented many of the companies up here, Supercell, King. I uh, did the giant side of the Playtika deal and, and uh, in general involved in transactions uh, around, the, uh, around the world in the game space. I've got a great panel. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to uh, do the name, rank, and serial number. So name, company, and what is your mission in one or two sentences as Corp Dev? Because uh, it varies from company to company what you're supposed to be getting for the for the company, and we'll jump in the discussion. So, Sean, I'm gonna start with uh, Sean Lee Rifleman two five six seven. No, <laughs> <laughs> although I was a sergeant in the Korean Army, um, I manage Corp Dev at Wargaming. We're a small indie developer. We make little games like World of Tanks and World of Warships. Uh, anything else I should add? Uh, no. Well, Weather is nicer in Cyprus, which is our headquarters. It is. Hi, I'm Jakko Harlas from Supercell. Uh, doing developer relations, meaning that we're investing in other studios and teams and generally just looking to find great teams out there. Hi, Drew Bortz from Nexon. Uh, mission being try and duplicate the success we've had in Asia in the West. Hi, I'm Brenda Way from Jagex. Uh, we run the 18-year-old MMORPG game called RuneScape. Our mission is to build a home of living games. Hi, my name is Shanti Bergel. I uh, run Corp there for Fun Plus. Uh, Fun Plus is probably best known for its strategy games like uh, King of Avalon and uh, Guns of Glory. Uh, my role is to work with uh, external developers and partners uh, across investments, acquisitions, and strategic partnerships. I think it's relevant that uh, there is not an American co company up here. That uh, the uh, um, we're, we're technically an American company. Are you? We started in Palo Alto, California. Okay, great. That works. Then one of one of five. Um, so when you're looking to um, engage with a company for the first time with a p potential investment, um, talk about the stage. You know, are you looking for the executive who just is leaving a major company to start a brand new studio, uh, an early stage team? Do you want to get there? How much proof does there need to be for you to be interested in working with a company? And why don't we start with Shanti? So in our case, it's yes to all the above, but for different parts of our company. Um, so for the executive who might be considering leaving, that's much more my world. And you know, like we would consider partnering with folks who have a great track record and want to start a new company at the seed level uh, or even later. Um, and so we invest in you know kind of all startups across gaming, esports, um, and uh, digital media. Um, but there are other aspects of our company that come into play when you start talking about. Um, being, uh, having a game in the market and wanting a publishing deal, wanting to get into particular territories. Um, despite being uh, originally an American company, um, most of our games are actually built in China and we have a strong presence there. Um, and so we have certain advantages uh, helping country, uh, companies get into certain Asian markets. Um, and so depending on you know, like the stage of the company, um, you know, we have different answers to that question. Um, so primarily for us, it's about working with people who are passionate about their category and are hopefully, you know, like either best in class already or capable of becoming best in class. Um, and that's usually filters for our founding team who are all gaming entrepreneurs themselves uh, as they kind of look for kindred spirits across the industry um, and people that they think um, can succeed at the level that they've, you know, managed to themselves and help them do it. And how about Jagex? I guess it's very similar to what Shanti <laughs> just said. The, the correct answer is always, it depends, right? It depends. It depends on the, 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 um, who's looking at it. If we're looking at from a M&A <coughs> point of view, we tend to look at more mature companies, so definitely not your uh, a founder leaving the company, just finding, uh, founding a new game studio. Uh, for m and targets, we tend to look at um, a relatively mature team who have launched, uh, hopefully, multiple titles successfully. Has, an ex has experience in uh, new way in marketing and running live ops. But we also, at Jagex, we newly established um, a, a business line called Jagex Partners, which does third party publishing. So in that function, we can look at less mature uh, teams, but who has, uh, who, know, who know what they're building, who have figured out their games, preferably in a later stage, in early access, or et cetera. So also depends on, uh, what angle we're looking at. Is it a publishing deal or is it an M&A deal? So, so Drew, how about, uh, how about Nexon? And could you comment on publishing as a, um, as a specific you know, service that you work on with, uh, with other companies? 
with smaller developers? Yeah, um, I come up with something original <laughs> after those two answers. Um, I, I guess the best way to, to think about it, if I were sitting in your shoes, is that uh, M&A is for likely a later stage, a minority investment or a publishing deal with funding is for an earlier stage, almost regardless of who you are. There are, of course, exceptions. The talented executive leaves and we want to fund them 100% from the get-go. That's certainly one uh, example. But for younger stage companies, earlier on in their life cycle, uh, project finance and or publishing, some combination thereof, is most of what we do in the West as of today. So contrast that with what Supercell does, because publishing is not in your remit in, at Supercell. What, what relationship do you want to have with a company and who are you looking for? Yeah, so we, yeah, we, you're right, so we don't do publishing, so I think whenever we invest, it's, it's uh, through equity. And well, we, we look at early stage studios and also later stage teams, like we've invested in Space Ape here in London, mm -hmm. or, and they're sort of more mature. Um, but I think it ultimately comes down to, as Michael said in the previous panel, it's about the people and the teams and trying to find those strong teams that kind of have a, or either already have had a big impact in the market or have the potential to do that at some point in the future. Or, I mean, if you can provide also an example of, of one that you think is a, a particularly good uh, yeah, uh, the recent one we did uh, over here in Guildford, in London, um, and going back to answering your question, it's largely driven either by need and or desire. And in our particular case with the Guildford case, we had both a need and a desire to uh, work with and gain rapidly capabilities in the Unreal space and studios or a studio that understood particular geographical direction and that's a combination of both the need of what we needed, but also a certain desire, a strategic desire in terms of how we want to take the company, company forward and what kind of assets we would need or resources we would need to do that. And when you came to them, do they come with their own IP or are they uh, capacity to, to develop your, own, your, uh, your games and extend those? What, what, is the, you know, what does that combination look like? I think in our particular case, um, we are still fairly young as a studio and a company. And so a reflection of that is we're still kind of in the, we're fairly confident mindset. And what that means is we feel we can give largely the creative direction uh, to a studio who has certain attributes that can really take and run with that creative idea. So that's, that was a case for this one. For other companies, uh, they have different perspectives and mindsets on this. I'd love to get the re reaction of the panel in terms of giving creative direction to the investee companies. Do you want to invest in companies that you can give creative direction to, or are they going to uh, respond well to that, uh, to that input? No, they would not. Uh, <laughs> or at least companies we are interested in would not respond well to that. We, we like to engage with companies that add something to what we do rather than duplicate what we do. We, we are lucky enough to have a very strong power base, mostly in Korea, but throughout all of Asia, where we do a lot of our own in-house development. Uh, so we are looking for the piece that we lack. And when we find that, it's generally on the creative side. Uh, and that tends to be a very poor thing for us to then dictate, here's what you must do creatively. How does the Supercell relationship with their companies is, because you're known as one of the strongest creative teams in the world, uh, and you're talking to people who want to hear your, your input. Is that who you want to, is that, the, is that the investment thesis for any um, of I think we want to find teams who have their own creative direction and we want to empower the team. So we don't really believe that we can control what a team, what team, team should do in terms of what kind of games they should make. So we want to empower them and give them complete operational and creative freedom. And of course, if there's ways we can help them, then we're happy to do that. But we're very much like hands off on that. So how important is geography to your choice? Does it matter where the team is? Um, you know, do you have opinions about Boy, the UK is a great place to have a team. 
I wouldn't invest in China. You know, how um, do do you go out saying I need to find a Latin American partner? You know, how does how does geography affect your choice, your 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 filter? Well, I can comment on our kind of criteria as we went through uh, the recent process. The short version of it is, it, it it's got to reflect how you operate as a company. In the case of wargaming, we like to be a little bit more involved. We liked everybody to be more in the loop, to be closer both mentally and physically. So from that perspective, we, we had a strong preference for studios that are in, let's just say, plus or minus three time zones from where Wargaming is main power bases. So for us, that was very important. Uh, and also, uh, we've had some recent um, experiences where we were working with studios that were further away and kind of post-mortem, we've kind of felt those to be a bit challenging for us as a company. How about Jagex? Uh, for Jagex, we, uh, for the targets we've looked at uh, have been primarily in Europe, uh, and also that's because our game, our player base is, uh, are in those areas. We have about 50% player base based in North America, so it makes sense for us to uh, to build upon the live ops experience we've gathered from all those years and to, to use that in our uh, future endeavors. Um, we ha we're a Chinese-owned company. We're listed in Shanghai Stock Exchange, so uh, China or Asia is also uh, within the radar, but we're not as actively looking in those regions as in the West. And Fun Plus? Yeah, I would say um, we definitely think about talent first and geography, you know, like probably fifth. Um, so geography for us is not a real kind of major filter or concern. Uh, that said, it is, as Sean says, you know, like a function of how much control you give that team over their destiny. So it's a function of our organizational structure that we are quite decentralized. Um, so we tend to, you know, kind of give a lot of creative control to each of our teams because we expect a lot out of each and every one of them. Um, and so it's not a real kind of creative risk for us to kind of uh, have a team that is in a quote unquote far flung place. Um, we have teams in North America, in China, in, um, in Japan, in India, in, you know, we have a, about to have a team in Southeast Asia, we have a team in Taiwan, um, and I'm probably forgetting someplace. Um, but you know, like adding another geography for us is not a thing because we are much more concerned about the leadership of that group. Um, so if we think that we can collaborate with them um, and then they can own their own outcome, that's primarily the, the, the first thing that we look for. Um, is, is this a team that can come to the, to, the, to the rest of the collective group? We're organized more as a federation of startups than like a big company. And so we look across the group, can you basically get value out of your peers? Um, and less take direction from the center. I think a federation of startups is a really good way of looking at that. That's, a, that's certainly a, a, that is one of the models, and it is not the dominant model necessarily, but I, you know, would, would you, at, at Nexon, when you're looking at companies, um, you know, how much of it is fitting it into a need that you have for either a geographic need or a platform need or a product need, and how much of it is just kind of enabling a new startup to uh, be successful where you're uh, going to be partnering with them? Truthfully, this is a, something that we go back and forth on uh, at any given time. Sometimes we will feel very strongly that there is no such thing as a portfolio strategy. You go with the best idea, even if you have something similar in the pipeline. Uh, sometimes referred to as the Oakland Raiders drafting strategy for American football fans in the house. Um, other times we say, well, that's a really good execution, but that game or we have another in the pipeline. And it vacillates depending on where we are with both our internal development and our external partners. By and large, if you have a creative idea, it will you will have a difficult time slotting it into, but we are already doing that. Creativity stands on its own, and that's the thing that really gets us excited. So while there may be some similarities to something we're doing or some need we think we see, uh, creativity will trump, and that's what we'll go with. So let's talk about the role of other investors, because we've had people on the panels before, the super angels, the venture capitalists, the um, you know, strategics. I, when you come into a company, Let's first start as an equity investor. If you want to be an equity investor in a company, 
how tolerant are you of other existing financial investors staying on the cap table? Can you live alongside them? Do you want to move them out? Uh, is that, that's an interesting dynamic. If you are already having angel investors at the table uh, and an investor a strategic comes in, you know, is it a replacement? Is it an addition? Jaka? Yeah, I think um, we're generally pretty ag agnostic about that one. So um, if we come in as an equity investor and you already have financials there, I think it's ultimately the decision to the founders. If the founders think that it will still add value to have the financials on the cap table, then I think we're generally fine with that. But also to add to that, I think usually it makes life a bit more easier if we are there on our own. Uh, just, just thinking about the uh, steps down the line when you know the VCs need to start thinking about an exit and, and so on. So of course you need to think about the discussion you, you need to have at that point and, and do you even want to get there or do you want to just clean out the cap table at the beginning? Mm -hmm. I guess for a Chinese company it's easy. We need to consolidate the income statement so it has to be uh, over 50% so it has to be majority. Uh, but on a JAGX level, if we're making equity investments, uh, taking a minority share, we don't really mind financial investors. And f some funds, VC funds, who are very well connected, who have been in, this, in the industry for a long time, they can actually add a lot of value as well. So we do not mind them um, uh, being there. Any allergic reaction to, to financial investors? If you're, yeah, uh, we, we quite like financial investors, actually. I mean, we've worked well with financial investors across any number of uh, situations and actually made them a lot of money. Um, and so we have no allergic reactions. We are mostly kind of founder first. We want to understand the founder's vision. And we are supportive of other investors that can help get them there. Um, so we want to be that type of investor ourselves. Um, and so you know, like we think that that's you know, kind of a clean alignment of course. Um, we're not the type of strategic investor that ties a lot of things to our participation in their future. Um, and we try not to have any signaling risk associated with our, our presence, meaning, you know, I think there's a boogeyman that a lot of kind of financial investors are afraid of when a strategic comes into the conversation that, oh, this will scare off other kind of members of the industry. Um, if, you know, like, XYZ company is in there, then, you know, like, the, their competitor won't be interested in acquiring them someday. Um, I can tell you personally, I've had experience that flies directly in the face of that. Um, when I ran Corp Dev at Gree, we acquired a company that our direct competitor had invested in. Yep. Um, and that happens all the time. Um, and it just basically indicates the changing needs of strategics um, over time and the changing needs of other companies that might want to step in and pick up where the other company left off. Um, and so I, I completely reject the idea that having a strategic in your cap table signals something especially in the games industry, where a lot of the buyers are sophisticated to under, enough to understand that that's really not the case. Um, I, I think it depends on who that strategic is and what rights they've tied to participation in your company. That's where you see it. Um, so I've looked at deals on the acquisition side where it was impossible to acquire the company because the, the other parties had basically agreed to so many future rights, say on future titles, for example, that it just basically made it impossible for anybody else to come in. So long as you're not entering into those types of relationships, I think it's clean and our relationship with the founders is, again, the same as, as, a, as a financial would be. And financial investors should have no uh, kind of allergic reaction to us because um, that's the kind of investor we try to be. But I think I would like to add to that, though. <clears throat> there is implication of the kind of strategics that you're taking on. So for good or for bad, I mean, I think we would all like to believe we're all good and helpful and wonderful, but I think there is a, there is a range of differences in terms of the actual value or the perceived value that any strategic would bring. So if we, sit, for example, are looking at something and there's a strategic in there, who it is may signal a certain kind of thing. Of course, you would have to dive into details of what all of that means, as, as Shanti said, but at, at, at a glance, there, there are certain signals that the kind of strategic can send off. So I guess my summary point here is, it, if you're considering taking a strategic investment, it is important to consider who you're taking it from. So, so, so I'm building on that point, um, actually one point I want to make and, and emphasize, this is when a strategic comes in, it is a different, they care more about the alignment with the founder they oftentimes will align more with the founder than they, than they will with the financial investors. 
because their uh, time horizon is typically longer than the financial investor's time horizon. So when they say they want to hear what the founder has to say, this is an opportunity for the founder to pivot away from the financial investors or to justify the financial investors at the table with a completely different voice that's not going to align completely with your financial investors. So that's a, that is a break in the, um, in, in the ownership uh, structure. So um, some of the signals, what is your feeling on the, uh, the, the phrase that, that I hear all the time is path to control? So if you come in as a minority investor, um, the future, if you're just an equity, let's just say you're an equity investor. We'll come, come to the operating side later. If you have a publishing relationship. But if you're an equity investor, do you need a path to control to invest? Some companies have to have one. No. Fun plus is no. No. Um, not necessarily. Okay. No, no disrespect to the lawyers in the room. But, but I, I tend to optimize more for the substance of the working relationship. At the end of the day, like, no matter what clause you have, if you, if you don't have the foundational relationship with the studio, then no one's really going to save it. And vice versa, even, even if you don't have uh, particular clauses per se, if you have a fantastic relationship with whoever you're working with, it's, it's, it's going to be so easy. By the way, like, excellent attorneys know this as well, so I'm sure when you advise, that's, what you, that's how you advise as well. A absolutely, it, but, but there is a, um, I, I'm actually very glad to hear that that is the, the universal answer. There are newer strategic investors who come in and see the toehold as their opportunity to get an option on the company. Um, and that is a, um, you wanna be careful with those folks. So, a uh, bit of a trick question. I, the, the express path to control. If they're building a relationship and they want to be your friend long term, that's a different kind of, uh, kind of relationship. Let's talk about operating agreements, publishing agreements, and project finance relationships versus an equity relationship. Because there's two very, very different ways of funding a business. Uh, when you're talking about, um, you know, for example, I think, Yako, th that the supercell strategy is to only go, you said earlier, equity only. Yeah, I think at least so far we've been, pre our preference has been, we mm -hmm. feel it's, uh, it's more simple, it also aligns the interest of us and the, the founders better. And if you have a sort of complex publishing slash project financing relationship, it just, you tend to end up in uh, having to go through a lot of complex, complex issues that you can avoid with equity. So for us, it's just an easier way of, of arranging the relationship. Drew, you want to comment on that from the Nexon side? We do a lot of project finance and publishing deals. They rarely work out the way everybody thinks they're going to work out. Um, I would, sitting in this seat, talking to founders, I tend to tell them, you actually want to do an equity deal. You don't want to do a project financing deal. Nobody believes me. But the truth is that a project finance deal really only works from the founder and employee side if you have a hit day one. If you don't have a hit day one, you are going to have to take more money that's more debt, or you're going to have to do an equity raise at worse terms, or you're gonna to have to end up taking on something you don't wanna do, whether that is work for hire or prioritizing a different project over the current one. It's rarely uh, enough runway to get you to grow a game over years. If you think you have a hit right off the bat and you wanna place chips on that, project finance is probably the way to go. I happen to think equity is better for both sides. That's not a universally shared point. I like to get each of the, so how about the JAGX perspective on that? I think Sean makes, a, I'm sorry, um, Drew makes a really good point here. Um, for JAGX, uh, JAGX partners approach, because we are not your, uh, typical project financing partner. We're not going to throw tons of you and money at you for you to for you to to grow up and and grow exponentially at day one. We tend to have this what we call white glove approach. We work very closely with the developers. We want to share our analytics, our marketing, our community manage, management, all the live ops experience we have. So we tend to work very closely with developers, and that's why ours is 
um, sort of a hybrid between uh, an equity and uh, project financing deal. So we want to make sure our interests are aligned <coughs> and risk is fairly shared between the two parties. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we look for most in our deals. And do you do both equity and project finance in the same company? And some of the development process. So that's sort of what you see as a equity investment. So the deal is structured in that way. We don't necessarily take a share of the, of, of the company. So it's, it's like shared risks. Uh, so sense. you'll do advances. Um, you can look or minimum at it, guarantees, or or uh, if, it's, if it's if you're publishing for them, or, or yeah. whatever. How about the Fund Plus perspective? So, uh, historically, Fund Plus has tried some of the uh, the project financing and publishing uh, kind of ideas. Um, didn't really have a lot of great success with them. Uh, this was prior to my arrival. I've been with the company about a year, um, and we've been focused on equity investments primarily since I joined. Um, and that'll probably continue to be the case. We don't have um, inside Fund Plus a real kind of um, appetite for that type of uh, kind of project finance deal. And your most recent deal here was that an equity deal or was that a? Uh, uh, it was a pure acquisition. It was a pure acquisition. Okay. Um, so super simple. Mm -hmm. um, but just adding to what everybody's saying, I mean, there's a, there's two sides to two perspectives to consider. From a strategic perspective, it would be such a pity if you made a project finance or publishing deal, they tried something, it failed, you no longer have a relationship with them, and the next project they do is a mega hit. That would be horrendous. From your perspective as a studio, you, don't, you also don't have a fantastic strategic partner who's coming along trying to help you, but the format is a project finance yep. or some sort of publishing thing. You work on that one thing together. That thing doesn't work out. They don't have any incentives to further help you out. They're just going to walk away, right? So it's, it, the, the perspective is, when you look at both perspective, it makes a lot of sense. But you've got a valuation problem. So if you're a founding team and you have a need to raise 30 to $50 million to build a game and you take it all in as equity, um, that's going to be highly dilutive to the uh, existing shareholder base. So, I, you know, how, how do you, is, is project finance a bridge on valuation sometimes? Does it allow you to put more money at play without reducing the, the founder's stake down below a certain percentage? We have split it in the past. Uh, some percentage is allocated to equity, others is allocated to project finance. Uh, sometimes that works, but at the end of the day, we are trying to align risk sharing. If we're funding your project 100%, you have very little incentive to really make sure it works because at the end of the day, your bills are paid and if you need more money, you come back to us and say, hey, we can't make the game you've already invested X million of dollars into, we need more money. And then I have to make a choice. Do we walk away? We give you even more money than we should. Uh, that is a really tough situation, and it's a not uncommon one, unfortunately. So uh, when we have an equity stake in a company, we are more inclined to give you that runway. Uh, Mark makes a great point about a valuation concern. That's all part of the math that will go into figuring out what the right deal is, but more equity for an idea we believe in is generally where, what we think to be the better outcome. And if you're doing project finance or publishing, is it only a single title deal or do you have hooks into future uh, titles that they do? At, at, at JAGX? Uh, for the time being, we're only looking at single title. Really? We, okay. We might uh, expand to multiple titles. No. The most I've done at Nexon, we did a six game slate deal that was a combination of equity and project finance. Uh, the, that was a, a one-off. Most commonly, it's for one game with options towards future games, depending on a variety of criteria. And it's those options for future games that oftentimes get in the way of a potential future acquirer who would come in, a, an alternate uh, strategic who, so what, what do you do if you're coming in and, and there's, uh, they, they've already tied up the sequels to their game, the sequels to the sequels, et cetera, uh, how interesting is that as a pot potential investee company of yours? If, if there's an other strategic already owning that uh, franchise into, into perpetuity? 
Well, I think that's where deal making comes into place, right? You just uh, going back to what some of the folks are saying, like your needs and desires as a strategic changes all the time. So whoever made that deal with that, 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 that studio at that point, probably the situation has changed. Maybe all they want is just out. Maybe if, if probably they want some form of out and they need to save face by cutting some sort of a deal with the new acquirer. So, I mean, that's as simple of an answer I can give you is, 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 it, is it is solvable. Most of, the, most of the time I've seen these kinds of things, it's solvable because generally there's some compromise point that everybody can kind of meet, meet in the middle. So, um, Yako, you're spending most of your time on the mobile side and uh, that I think is one of the things driving the do you do project finance or publishing because it's, you know, it's, the developer has more power in that space. Is, are there publishing deals being done in mobile by the other folks at the, on, the, on the panel where you're providing, you know, cash for, for a mobile game and, you know, putting it under your label? We are. Okay. Ours is more uh, still PC focused, although rapidly towards mobile, we launched a mobile title and now we're learning every day the mobile PC crossplay. So mm -hmm. it, it is moving towards uh, mobile quite rapidly. So um, let's talk about geopolitics and how that impacts. I, rumor has it that China's not a <laughs> great place to be publishing games these days. I, how has that impacted both your appetite for games, if you have a uh, significant Chinese uh, operation, and the behavior of other competitors in the marketplace? Or the behavior of your owner uh, you know, uh, at, at Supercell, the majority owner? Yeah, maybe if I start. So I guess for us it's been really a practical problem and it's like a headache because of course as you might have seen we launched Brawl Stars just before Christmas and of course we would like to get the game out in China uh, the sooner the better but of course like when there was this game approval freeze we couldn't really do anything so it's been a sort of uncertainty for us like when when can we actually go out in China and, and what do we need to do to get it get it out there so it's been mm -hmm. like a very practical problem for us. Uh, for us we're luckier because operationally although we're Chinese owned we are uh, operationally very independent so uh, the the hold off of the Chinese government giving our games license has not really impacted us. Uh, more on the shareholder financing point of view, they have to uh, realign their own uh, financing structure. There have been some restructuring uh, happening in China, so that's happening at the parent level, but locally, operationally, we have not been affected. So it, it's ironically had some positive effects for us. Um, so it has to do with just the quirks of our history and the way we're structured. Um, so we started life as a, as a venture back startup in the US. Uh, most of our games are built in China. We have most of our employees in China. Um, so it has this weird effect of us kind of in the West being perceived as a Chinese company, and kind of we are. And in China, we're perceived as a Western company, and we are. Uh, but in the current climate, what that means is that some you know, kind of Chinese partners see us as a bridge to the West. Because uh, we have historically been that for a lot of other kind of, uh, of our ch partners in China. Um, and so the number of inquiries on that vector has increased, actually. Um, and so because we are seen as, you know, kind of a, a good company to work with in that particular format, you know, like we're actually getting a lot of inbound from, you know, other Chinese partners. And we have a strong, uh, because we're perceived as a Western company there, we have a very broad partnership um, kind of footprint that spans Tencent, NetEase, and the Century Group, um, which is fairly uncommon. You don't usually That's very that. unusual, yeah. Um, and so we have, a, we have a very strong relationship with, with Tencent. Um, we sold a, a very large studio to Century Group, and the Century Group and Tencent are both investors in a company called Shanda, which our founder is also on the board of. Um, and we also have a joint venture with NetEase um, on the esports side, uh, doing league operations globally for all of their esports titles. Um, so it has resulted, again, in just some quirks of the way we are have kind of made this into a positive for us. Uh, certainly didn't predict it. Have you seen valuations been, have been affected by, you know, a few years ago, every deal had multiple consortiums, consor consortia from Chinese, Chinese investors coming in, bidding up the prices. Uh, I don't see that anymore. Is that creating a slightly better, I uh, world for investing or is there enough, enough competition from other, uh, other publishers out there? 
it is uh, the market has not cooled on valuations to the degree I would like it to have. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it, it, people are still using China money deals as comps, uh, which leads to sometimes an awkward conversation between us and founders or founders plus advisors uh, that we're just not on that same page anymore because the, the realities that led to those valuations are no longer in play to the degree they were. Yako, do you want to comment on that? You, you smile. Yeah, no, I would agree with Drew. Um, so I don't think we've seen a sort of meaning, meaningful cool down in valuations, probably for the reasons that, that you mentioned. Um, of course, we've been also more active on the sort of early stage mm -hmm. uh, situations where like multiples are not relevant. So, but yeah, would agree. Uh, one more question, and then I'll open up, up for a couple from the uh, from the audience. Uh, one from the audience, uh, and this might be just a you know we're in London and the political climate is a little bit uh, chaotic. Uh, do you see the any impact from uh, Brexit on the role of the UK as the leading um, European home for developers, or do you even believe that the UK is the leading home for the European developers? Is it really Scandinavia? So. Well, I mean, once again, comment, commenting on our Guildford um, studio, uh, I would say, similar to China thing, I, I would say it's more of a, a, I would like to believe it's a short-term headache. I would, li I would like to believe the, the, the kinks will be uh, ironed out, even prior to EU or US before Trump or whatnot. People would always be able to hire the, the right people through the right venues. It's just a matter of how easy or difficult it is. So. My fundamental view on UK being a source of great talent for any different types of games, I don't think that that, that doesn't change at all. Uh, and the short-term wrinkles will be iron. Yeah, I think speak, having spoken to like Space Ape and Trailmix, who are London-based uh, portfolio companies, I, I, to me it seems that it's, of course, it's creating uncertainty, and uncertainty is never great. But still, I also believe that London is definitely one of the gaming, most important gaming hubs in the, in the world, and there's a lot of creative talent, talent here. So I don't see that going away anytime soon. Maybe if you have a multinational team who's wondering where to set up their next studio, then of course Brexit will sort of produce the points that London will have mm -hmm. in, in that sort of comparison. But at least so far, we believe it's a, it's a source of uncertainty, but it's not going to you know, make like diminish London's value as a sort of gaming hub. And Jagex has, is a significant uh, um, <coughs> employer here, and yeah, um, we don't we, we don't see that impact so much. And actually, uh, with Brexit, we well, it's not entirely directly linked to Brexit, but we have recently, in the past six months or so, hired a lot of talents from the U.S. Um, partially because that's where a lot of the M MMO uh, talents sit. So we already see an international flow of talent. It's it doesn't have to be. Uh, centered around Europe. 